Welcome, uh, colleagues, and most of all, uh, welcome, uh, distinguished uh, Foreign Minister of the Republic of China, Taiwan, uh, an old and dear friend, Joseph Wu. Uh, let me uh, introduce uh, the minister, uh, and then we'll have the honor of hearing from his remarks, and I believe he's agreed to take a few questions. Uh, to those who are listening to our uh, broadcast version, I'm Larry Diamond. I'm a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution with Admiral Jim Ellis. Um, I co-chair uh, the Hoover Project on Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and uh, it's our great honor to have with us as our keynote speaker, closing our proceedings at this conference today on ensuring peace in the Taiwan Strait, the Honorable uh, Joseph Wu. Foreign Minister uh, Wu has been Foreign Minister uh, of the Republic of China, Taiwan, since I believe 2018. Prior to that, uh, he served in 2017 and 2018 as Secretary General in the office uh, of the President, and then before that as Secretary General uh, at the National Security Council. So you can see he is highly regarded uh, not only throughout Taiwan, but by President Tsai Ing-wen, since he's held probably the three top positions in her administration. Prior to that, he was Secretary General of the Democratic Progressive Party uh, in the two years uh, prior to it returning to executive power in Taiwan, 2014 to 16. And uh, for four years, he was representative of uh, the Democratic Progressive Party uh, to the United States, and prior to that, he had been uh, the head of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in Washington. And of course, he is one of uh, Taiwan's most distinguished scholars of international relations, uh, a longtime uh, research fellow at the Institute of International Relations at National Chengchi University, which is where I first met him. Uh, and he knows the United States well because he has an MA in political science from the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and a PhD in political science from Ohio State University. So Minister Wu, it's an honor for the Hoover Institution to host you uh, in this closing event at our conference today, and we now give you the floor. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Happy to be with you all online. And Dr. Diamond, my old friend, it's been a long time, and it is wonderful to see you. I want to thank you for inviting me to address the pressing issue of peace over the Taiwan Strait. Without any academic deliberation on the definition and operationalization of what the concept of peace is about, the subject of cross strait peace and stability has never caught so much international attention since 1995 to 6 when Taiwan was having the first democratic presidential election amid Chinese missile threat. A quarter century has passed since then, and now tensions over the Taiwan Strait seems to be escalating to a degree where many international military leaders consider that a war is likely to take place in five to 10 years. Many crucial dialogues have stressed the importance of peace and stability over the Taiwan Strait, including US-Japan summit, Osman 2021, G7 Summit, NATO Summit, Japan-EU Summit, and many more. Like it or not, the maintenance of peace and stability of the Taiwan Strait has become an important issue in the Indo-Pacific region. And all discussions surrounding this issue point to one actor as the main source of destabilization, and you know who that is. Taiwan faces overwhelming military threat. We have to deal with the Chinese Air Force incursions into our ADIZ almost on a daily basis. At times, the PLAAF will fly multiple warplanes to simulate attack on us, targeting particularly our bases in the East and Southeast. In fact, this happened just a few days ago on September 23rd, when our MND identified as many as 24 Chinese warplanes doing just that. Yes, it was a threat and a very serious one. Yet many still think that uh, there must be a specific event to trigger major Chinese military exercises around Taiwan. They would say that visits of foreign high-level officials, for example, would prompt 
the Chinese military into taking actions. Arguments like this point to Taiwan as the initiator of provocation. But if you look at the exercise on September 23rd, the Chinese did not even bother faking any excuse anymore. You may ask what the Chinese motivation or objective in their Air Force exercises. Here's my humble view. First, which is to maximize their gain in gray zone tactics. They want to continue to cut into our ADIZ as much as possible and to make it their own space of operation. They want to keep pushing for their gain, knowing that we will not fire the first shot. This is also what happened in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. In the East China Sea in particular, the Chinese official vessels are now patrolling the disputed waters on a daily basis and even chasing away Japanese fishing vessels at times. Second, the Chinese wants to use their numerical strength to wear down both our pilots and airplanes. This has already taken a toll on the Taiwanese Air Force. Third, the PLA is practicing hard on attacking Taiwan by familiarizing with the battlefield, i.e. conditions in the airspace, Taiwan and US responses, and etc. The exercise on September 23rd appeared to be simulating a real attack involving multiple supporting airplanes and advanced jet fighters, including J-16 and Su-30, to escort the H-6 bombers through the Bashi Channel to the southeastern side of Taiwan. Such military threat go on. While we face a tough debate, on going asymmetric. But before a real war takes place, the stalemate is likely to continue and we need the traditional platforms to patrol our waters and protect our skies. We have no choice. This is our daily life in Taiwan. Fortunately, I'm not the defense minister who has to constantly watch which coming sortie is real, but he's not alone. We in the government all have to share the responsibility of keeping Taiwan safe. We have seen intensifying infiltration, influence operation, disinformation campaign, cyber attack, hybrid warfare, and etc. Recently, we have even seen a series of cases where young Chinese took rafts to various spots around Taiwan's coast and outer islands as if they were testing how to penetrate through our radar coverage. Few in Taiwan envy the job of the defense minister, but honestly, even fewer envy the job of the foreign minister. The silent diplomatic war has been going on for many years. The Chinese foreign ministry has mission to take out our diplomatic allies and sabotage our relations with like-minded partners who do not have diplomatic relations with us. The Chinese also block us out of major international organizations by citing ANGA Resolution 2758, even though the resolution says nothing about the status of Taiwan. And now the situation has become even worse where all Taiwanese passport holders, whether you are a student, tourist, journalist, or NGO members invited to UN events are not allowed in the UN building. There's a sign at the entrance demanding us to use documents issued by the Chinese government. And you are right, every Taiwanese makers, but not for the Minister of Foreign Affairs. In addition, our nomenclature in various international public and private organizations, airlines, and contests and games has been changed from Taiwan or the Republic of China to Taiwan, China or Taiwan province of China. And the trend continues with the latest by Fitch ratings and Moody's. The Chinese keep waging these aggravating maneuvers against the Taiwanese. But when I point out that this is not my real name, my real name is Taiwan, the Chinese will scream and accuse me of being provocative. In fact, I have been branded lately by the Chinese for trying to make corrections of what they have done to us as being too provocative that they will pursue me for the rest of my life. Dear friends, I used to be in academia like uh, Dr. Diamond and many of you present today. I tend to look at the larger picture, a global strategic picture to understand the dynamics. And this helps me maintain a clear eye on where Taiwan stands and how to safeguard our national interests by pursuing appropriate foreign policies and relations. 
And what I see is an intense strategic competition posed by China's expansionism. The fall of Hong Kong as a shining beacon of liberalism is very telling. It sent a chill through the Taiwanese people that it is what the Chinese government is capable of in confiscating freedom and human rights. And if Hong Kong is not enough for us to worry, how about Xinjiang? Not to mention that the Chinese government is now exporting its digital means of control to other countries. If you call this an ideological war, Taiwan happens to be on the front line. Taiwanese people are proud to embrace freedom and democracy. But deep down, we also understand that this is what the Chinese Communist government cannot condone. It wants to have more control beyond its own population by infiltration, influence operation, and disinformation campaign, and etc. But Taiwan's democratic success proves its draconian model of governance unfit. As long as the ideological warfare goes on, Taiwan will continue to face the threat of invasion. The Chinese expansion in the East and South China Seas is already very obvious, but I see some countries in my neighborhood wanting to have American protection while hanging on to the economic benefit provided by China. I see a gradual expansion of Chinese influence over the Pacific with the fall of Solomon Islands in 2019. The Chinese are now coming to the doorstep of Australia. The string of pearls strategy and debt traps in the Indian Ocean are a subject studied for more than a decade. In Africa, I'm not sure any country can compete with China for political and economic influence. In Central and South America, the rising trend of leftist governments will be very unpleasant for the United States. Europe worth careful study when it comes to global strategic competition. This is democracy's most important passion, but we are witnessing some union members willing to side with China to block a policy from going through. Please do not make no mistake. I consider the transatlantic alliance a great thing. Taiwan shares relations with Europe, and I'm pleased to see the alliance relationship strengthened recently. But the nature of the union's decision-making mechanism allows China to prevent the EU from moving further through buying out a small number of countries. The competition also goes on on the trade and economic front. The Chinese government has formally submitted application to the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, or CPTPP. Some analysts think that the move aims at preventing Taiwan from becoming a member I tend to think that China wants to stand in the doorway to prevent the U.S. from coming back in to dominate the powerful regional trade bloc while targets China. To the Chinese Communist government, trade is not just trade. It is a weapon. And the CPTPP is its ammo to be, something that cannot fall into the hands of the U.S. We also see authoritarian forces cooperating and even coordinating with each other. Just as China intensified its threat against Taiwan, so too is Russia conducting large-scale military exercises and disinformation campaign, as well as hybrid warfare against the Eastern European countries. At the same time, Belarus floods its neighbors with refugees. Eastern European countries, including Poland and Lithuania, are on the front lines resisting such threats. They are courageous enough to stand up to the challenge and they are courageous enough to reach out to Taiwan and point out that democracies should support each other. They, along with the Czech Republic and Slovakia, have galvanized the Taiwanese people to seek better ties with like-minded countries. However, authoritarian threats cannot be reversed by courage alone, and our friends in Europe are right to point out that EU and NATO can do more to protect their member states when threatened by rogue actors. The global strategic picture is putting Taiwan on the spotlight, and we understand perfectly our responsibility. We need to stand up to the military threat and strengthen our own defense capability. We also need to continue pursuing a policy of prudence to deny the Chinese any excuse to launch an attack. Under President Tsai's leadership, this policy of prudence has prevented cross-strait conflict over the years. 
and it has won appreciation from our major international partners. At the same time, we need to continue to strengthen relations with like-minded countries with great effort. Our relations with the US, Japan, Australia, India, and some Central Eastern European countries have reached new heights. We have also won the international attention on the importance of peace and stability over the Taiwan Strait. I think we have been doing the right thing so far when it comes to our foreign relations. My dear friends, successive US administrations have called Taiwan a force for good in the world. We have been making significant contributions to the good causes and working closely with the United States, whether it is North Korea sanctions, religious freedom, counter-terrorism, or democracy and human rights promotion. We also work with the US and Japan by using Global Cooperation and Training Framework, or GCTF, as a platform to benefit the countries in the Indo-Pacific on various issue areas, such as cybersecurity, countering disinformation, maritime security, energy security, environment protection, public health, and HADR. We are proud of these cooperation programs, and we believe that there are many more good things we can do together with the US, Japan, and other like-minded partners. Dear friends, I sure wish that China would stop threatening us militarily and harassing us diplomatically so that we can do more good things for the world. Unfortunately, this is not the fact of life for Taiwan's foreign minister or for Taiwan's relations with China. Given this troublesome reality, and with the understanding of our position as a country on the front line, facing the expansion of authoritarianism, we need to continue to stay vigilant and prudent, bolster our own defense capabilities, and strengthen relations with fellow democracies to sustain peace over the Taiwan Strait. And I look forward to making this advancement with you wherever and whenever possible. Thank you very much, and I will welcome questions. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Wu, uh, for that uh, wide-ranging, uh, comprehensive, and spirited uh, set of remarks. Uh, you weren't with us today, but you've done a superb job of capturing a very wide range of the themes of our deliberations today. Uh, so uh, at least analytically, it reassures me that uh, we were talking about the right things. Do uh, any of my colleagues want to uh, ask the minister any questions? Yes, we'll start, um, uh, Mr. Minister, with someone you know well, the former chairman of AIT, Richard Bush. Foreign Minister Wu, it's very nice to see you, even in this virtual uh, setting. Um, I think you have a clear-eyed view of the threat that Taiwan faces and the stakes involved, not just for the people of Taiwan, but for uh, the region and the world. I'm going to throw you a softball. What are the three or four things that the United States can do that would most help Taiwan strengthen itself in meeting the challenges that you have described. Thank you. Okay, I'll just go ahead and answer the question from uh, my old friend, Richard. Richard. Uh, even though I'm not able to see you on the screen, but uh, it's wonderful to hear your voice. And this is a, a very important question for us to think about uh, in thinking about how to move uh, Taiwan's relations with the United States further. Uh, I have to uh, clarify first uh, even though I'm going to say things that uh, I hope uh, we can do together with the United States, but Taiwan's relations with the United States uh, have been very good already. Uh, and uh, it's our view, uh, it's also the U.S. administration's view, that the relations between Taiwan and the United States is in its best form so far. And we are very happy about that. And I would like to congratulate those who have been working on the Taiwan-U.S. relations uh, there are several things we think that are very important for us to continue to pursue uh, in our relations with the United States. Uh, the first, of course, uh, economic and trade. Uh, it is very important for the United States uh, to resume the TIFA dialogue with Taiwan uh, in June this year. Uh, but of course, it shouldn't stop there. Our ultimate goal is a uh, FTA or bilateral trade relations with each other. 
And we have been advocating for that for a long time. And many good friends in the U.S. and in Taiwan have also been advocating for that, uh, especially after uh, we uh, knock out the barrier uh, in the uh, Taiwan-U.S. trade relations, uh, i.e. the pork uh, importation uh, containing rectobamine. Uh, the reason why a trade agreement is important in between Taiwan and the United States is uh, for strategic reason. Uh, you know, if you look at the situation Taiwan is in, uh, we face multiple and multifaceted uh, threat coming from China. Uh, the Chinese government is trying to prevent Taiwan from having trade relations or uh, trade agreement with other countries. And the United States is the most important country for us. And if the United States is able to have a trade relations with us or trade agreement with us, I think it will serve as an example for other like-minded countries to pursue a trade agreement with Taiwan. And I think the United States is also looking at uh, uh, China's outward expansionism, uh, also on the trade and economic front. And I think the best way for the United States to deal with uh, the kind of aspect is to have more trade relations with other like-minded countries or partners in this region. And if you look around this region, Taiwan is probably the only country, the most important countries in this region, that the United States does not have a trade agreement. So I would urge the administration to consider very seriously for a bilateral trade relations. But before that is taking place, we also hope that a digital trade agreement can start the deliberation and discussions. And that is also very important. And other things would include uh, more security relations with each other. And again, I have to admit that the, tra the security relations between Taiwan and the United States is uh, very good. And in our eyes, uh, the uh, continued cooperation in between the two sides is outstanding. But we still think that there can be more uh, that we do together, you know, for example, to discuss with Taiwan on all kinds of possible scenarios so that Taiwan can make better preparation. And in fact, you know, there's some discussions going on. And if the discussion can intensify to help Taiwan's defense capabilities, that will be wonderful. And another area is uh, coming to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we continue to think that better political or diplomatic ties with Taiwan is very important. Uh, even though somebody would say symbolism should be given way to substance. I agree with that. Substance is very important. But in Taiwan's relations with the United States, very often, symbolism is also substance. So I would think that, that we need to consider all aspects of the relations between Taiwan and the United States on political or diplomatic area and see what we can achieve more. Uh, just give you some examples. You know, I have been able to uh, visit uh, some European countries and give open remarks or participate in some open uh, discussions or conferences. I think that should also be the case for the United States. And there are many capitals in the world I can visit, but not to the U.S. capital. So this is something that we need to think about where Taiwan and the U.S. can do more together. So basically, these are the three areas that we can do more with each other. But let me uh, say it once again, Taiwan-U.S. relations have already been a very good state, and we will continue that trend. Well, uh, one reason why these relations have been so good is that the Congress has been so supportive, and Shirley Khan has been engaging and supporting the Congress for a very long time from the Congressional Research Service. So, Shirley, you have a question? Um, I know you cannot get to Washington, D.C., and I think a lot of members of Congress would love to, for you to get there, but you've gotten pretty close to Washington, D.C. Um, so you were talking about, um, I want to focus on one, one thing, and that's in your purview. Uh, you discussed the military threats from, from the PRC, but what I really would like to hear is from the Minister of Defense, Chu, to talk about the, the military threat, and we really don't hear from him. Um, in terms of strategic communication, your role is so important, and I know you've been really visible out there and very vocal as well as visible. Focusing on the question, 
of UN Resolution 2758, a favorite topic of yours as well as mine. Uh, I have urged for years that we should have our diplomats rebut this big lie from China that Resolution 2758 of 1971 somehow determined that Taiwan is part of China, when that is completely false. It is fake news. In fact, for those who don't know, Resolution 2758 merely put the PRC um, into the UN, but did not determine the status of Taiwan. In fact, did not even mention Taiwan. That's how bad and, uh, this big lie is. So to me, it's a no-brainer to use information to rebut this disinformation from China that it uses as political warfare as um, precursor to, to the, the threats against Taiwan. So in terms of strategic communication, a lot of people in our military as well consider that Taiwan needs to do more in strategic communication. So two questions concerning 2758. One, do you think that someone like you might be able to put an article in, for example, the New York Times to explain how 2758, with the 40th um, anniversary coming up, really has nothing to do with Taiwan? And this would improve Taiwan's grassroots as well as public diplomacy. Second part of the question. In terms of dealing with our side in the US government, even though I've urged for us to rebut 2758 at the UN and other places, to me it's a no-brainer. Yet, somehow we can't find the will to do it. What do you think are the obstacles to U.S. diplomats rebutting 2758, and how would you like us to overcome such obstacles? Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Shirley. Uh, it's wonderful to hear your voice. Uh, and again, it's been a long time. Um, I think you mentioned to one uh, issue uh, that has been uh, preventing Taiwan from participating in international organizations, whether it's UN or uh, WHO or uh, UNFCCC and etc. Uh, the Chinese always use the resolution 2758 as an excuse to block Taiwan out of these international organizations or prevent Taiwan from having any voice in these international organizations. And as I said in the uh, opening remarks, uh, the Chinese have come to such a degree uh, that is very degrading for the Taiwanese people. You know, the Taiwanese passport holders, uh, even though it is recognized uh, by more than 100 countries in the world, it is not recognized in the UN. You know, we cannot use Taiwan passport to enter into the UN building. Uh, and there's a sign, it's very degrading to the Taiwanese people, that we need to use the Chinese document in order to get in. Uh, and therefore, uh, the Taiwanese are not able to get access to the UN for any purposes at all. And I remember in the, uh, 2007, uh, when I was serving as a Taiwan's representative to Washington, D.C., uh, we were uh, notified by the headquarters uh, that there was a letter issued by the UN Secretariat uh, when our diplomatic ally, Naulu, was submitting uh, a proposal to the UN Secretariat uh, asking the Secretariat to accept our uh, you know, deposit uh, when we ratified uh, the uh, CEDAW. Uh, but the letter from the UN indicated that according to Resolution 2758, UN, under all purposes and all conditions, recognized Taiwan as an integral part of the PRC. And of course, that is not the view of the Resolution 27, 2758. And it's not the view of the United States. And therefore, we need to make tremendous effort in trying to correct the mistake done by the UN uh, Secretariat. But of course, we are not a member of the UN. We are not even an observer. And the Chinese have become so powerful inside the Secretariat, and therefore they can, they can continue to impose the Chinese view on the UN Secretariat. And then it's built over to the WHO and other international organizations. And to the end, it's so difficult for Taiwan to have our voice heard or to take part in the activities 
uh, conducted by all these international organizations. So your suggestion is very important uh, for us to have our voice heard in the international uh, community through major uh, media or through conferences, through cooperation with think tanks in Washington, D.C., and all that. Uh, in fact, we have been doing that. Uh, I have written uh, numerous articles published worldwide, and I always cite uh, Resolution 2758, not an excuse to block Taiwan out. And we'll continue to do that. And thank you for making that suggestion for me to write an op-ed on the New York Times, and I'll try to do that. Uh, the second is the U.S. government. Uh, I think in 20, 2007, uh, the U.S. government uh, may have taken the issue uh, to the U.N. Secretariat and asked the U.N. Secretariat to stop uh, manipulating the resolution 27, uh, 2758 uh, to the degree where the United States is, uh, you know, thinking that uh, if if the uh, uh, UN Secretary continues to uh, manipulate that uh, resolution, uh, the United States may openly uh, distinguish itself from the UN position. So that is what's being on the media, uh, and I think the United States understand that the Chinese government has been imposing its view on the Secretariat of the UN to manipulate Taiwan's participation. And we understand that the United States may consider uh, doing something. And Taiwanese government will continue to discuss with the U.S. government on how to make a correction of the uh, Secretariat of the United Nations view on uh, Taiwan's role in the U.N. After all, the resolution uh, 2758 says nothing about Taiwan's status at all. And you are absolutely right. Uh, another person uh, you know well because uh, he is our most recent past director of the American Institute in Taiwan, uh, Brent Christensen. Hello, Foreign Minister Wu, or Joseph, may I call you that? Yes. It's uh, really, uh, really delightful to, uh, to see you. Um, and thank you for your very clear explanation of the uh, uh, the challenges that you are facing as as foreign minister, I'm I'm well aware of uh, of what those are, but you have explained them well. I wonder if um, you know you you described how uh, the PRC is is uh, uh, is working very hard to uh, uh, sideline Taiwan and and exclude Taiwan from international activities. I wonder if you could comment a little bit about the uh, global cooperation and training framework and how that. Uh, has has allowed Taiwan to have more of a voice in uh, uh, international affairs. Anyway, thank you very much. It's great to see you. Uh, it's wonderful to hear you, Brent, my dear friend. Uh, GCTF is a great invention by the State Department, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, back in 2015, uh, MOFA and the State Department uh, signed that agreement on GCTF and of course, going through the AIT and TECRO. And what that does is for Taiwan to host conferences or workshops on those issues that will benefit regional actors. Issues such as uh, what I mentioned in the uh, opening statement, uh, cybersecurity, uh, disinformation, HIDR, women's empowerment, uh, environment protection, or public health where Taiwan has been doing wonderful jobs. And we are willing to make contributions to the countries in this region. And so far we have been uh, conducting uh, so many forums and we have uh, uh, taken so many experts and officials in this region for uh, training purposes. Uh, and we consider that as a success. And I think GCTF is a great thing for us to work together to benefit the people in this region. And uh, perceptually, I think GCTF is also a wonderful way for Taiwan to avoid uh, China's attempt to block Taiwan's international participation because international participation takes place inside Taiwan. And the members of the international community will come to Taiwan for those purposes. And this is benefit uh, to the countries in this region. And we will continue to do that. And beginning from January 2019, uh, our very good friend, Japan, 
has also latched on uh, as a co-organizer of the GCTF. So this is something that we can see very clearly as Taiwan, U.S., Japan trilateral cooperation framework. You know, for many years, many people are thinking that the Taiwan, U.S., Japan should work more closely with each other. And GCTF has already done that. And these may not be focusing on traditional security areas, but many issues uh, discussed uh, in the GCTF are non-traditional security areas, like the ones I identified a little bit earlier, you know, whether it's maritime security or energy security or HADR or uh, cybersecurity. And it's wonderful that Taiwan, the United States, and Japan can work very closely with each other on those issues. And we have been expanding uh, the particip participation uh, for those who want to co-organize with Taiwan. Uh, for example, Australia uh, has been working together with us, uh, and uh, some countries in Europe are also working together with us, uh, and we will try to uh, continue to expand our uh, co-organizers. And there will be more, because uh, I see the rosters down the road, and it's very good uh, that this has already caught the international attention that working together with Taiwan under the GCTF is going to benefit the countries in the region. Uh, and we also uh, you know, discussed with the AIT when the brand was still here in Taiwan uh, to franchise uh, the GCTF, uh, to have the GCTF held in different regions. So now we have a GCTF round held in uh, Palau. Uh, we also had a GCTF held in the, uh, Guatemala, and we also had a GCTF uh, held in the, the Czech Republic. And of course, it's going to be held in the more countries in uh, the world. And it's wonderful that Taiwan, as a force for good in the world, can continue to make contributions. Uh, Karas, did you, do you have time for one more question, Mr. Minister? Yes. Great. Um, it, it's good to see you, Minister Wu. Uh, this is Karas Templeman speaking. Um, I have a question about... Uh, the DPP and its recent engagement with the LDP in Japan at a party-to-party -party level rather than as a state-to-state -state level. Uh, I found that uh, slightly ironic in that uh, the Taiwan party-to-party uh, -to -party model has typically been used between the KMT and the CCP to engage in cross-strait interaction. And you've kind of repurposed that model to engage with democratic partners and allies. And so I'm curious whether this is a one-off thing that's special to Japan or whether uh, the DPP, uh, President Tsai Ing-wen is the chair of the DPP, she could potentially uh, engage in this kind of party-to-party -party talks with other liberal demo democratic parties around the world and whether you've, you're, something like that is in the works or whether this is um, just a one-off thing. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Templeton. This is an outstanding question, uh, but it may not be very easy for me to uh, discuss about. Uh, I used to work in the DPP as Secretary General, as uh, Dr. Diamond mentioned at the beginning. Uh, with the difficulty uh, Taiwan is in uh, diplomatically, uh, we need all actors or political parties to think about uh, how to expand Taiwan's international space. And of course, political party, especially when Taiwan is already a democracy, uh, can be a very important uh, channel for Taiwan to expand its uh, uh, international outreach. Uh, before the DPP comes, uh, came back into power in 2016, uh, the DPP uh, has been working very hard uh, in expanding its international outreach through liberal international or through uh, you know, other regional uh, democratic political party uh, mechanism. And we have done a tremendous job in securing friendship with fellow uh, political parties. And we also try to do that uh, with other political parties, uh, not only in Southeast Asia, but also uh, all the way to uh, Europe. You know, liberal parties in uh, Europe has been a sister party of the DPP. So we have done a very good job in securing our relations with uh, fellow liberals uh, in Europe. And recently, uh, we also uh, conduct a uh, you know, telephone conversation between President Tsai and, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Lapid of Israel uh, before uh, his election. And it was also on a party-to-party -party basis. So we tried to reach out 
to other political parties on a party-to-party basis, because this is going to help Taiwan overall speaking uh, in a uh, tremendous way. So we will not give up uh, the party-to-party diplomacy, and that is an important channel for us to use. And you talk about the uh, recent party-to-party discussion between the President Tsai or Chairwoman Tsai and the LDP's uh, candidate for the presidency. Uh, that is also another uh, you know, venue that we use to strengthen our ties with uh, fellow democracies. So this is something that we do. Uh, but the difficulty for me as a Minister of Foreign Affairs is that uh, you know, we, we always talk about uh, foreign relations, uh, and we should leave the domestic infighting domestically, not to take it out to the country and engage in domestic politics in other countries. So for me, I should stay away from party politics altogether. And I've been doing that since uh, 2018. I have not been involved in the political party, and I have not uh, taken myself to any speech event for the political party, whether it's KMT or the DPP. And I think it's my role to be neutral on Taiwan's uh, domestic politics. But at any rate, you know, if any political party, they want to reach out to other uh, countries to establish party-to-party relationship, uh, that is going to be welcomed. Uh, and you mentioned about the uh, KMT-CCP relations. That is very odd indeed. Uh, but at least... What I heard this morning was that KMT is willing to consider reestablish its office in Washington, D.C. and reach out to the United States. And I'm sure they have a lot of explanation to do to the U.S. government. Well, Mr. Uh, Minister, uh, you uh, appear so dedicated to rising above the partisan fray that you're even wearing a tie that is green and blue. So I <laughs> yes, congratulate exactly. you for embodying the bipartisan spirit. I would like to note in closing uh, that um, uh, many of us who've been involved in this project of uh, studying Taiwan and uh, its democratic accomplishments and its increasingly formidable security challenges uh, very much hope to gather together in a delegation to come visit you uh, directly in Taiwan when your public health uh, uh, officials judge that the circumstances uh, will permit it safely. So I want to reiterate our interest in doing that. And I want to note for the benefit of our audience in conclusion that I was very pleased to hear uh, when I was in Washington last week that the World Assembly of Democracy uh, is going to uh, meet late next year at uh, the invitation of Taiwan Uh, several hundred Democrats will assemble there, again, circumstances permitting. So thank you for facilitating that. Uh, Thank you uh, for your uh, spirit of uh, nonpartisanship and your commitment to democracy and Taiwan's security. Uh, And most of all, thank you for joining us uh, here uh, at the end of our day, but we realize the beginning of another very busy day for yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.